For the next few minutes, we'll be discussing light-guided intubation and the new trach light stylet and tracheal light wand from Lairdoff. Originally reported on in 1958, light-guided intubation today offers a reliable and easily learned technique for accurately placing endotracheal tubes, size 6 or larger. We'll begin by describing the technique and by considering the indications for use of this new device. We'll then detail the product itself, demonstrating oral intubation, as well as showing how the trach light can be used to accurately position previously placed tubes. We'll conclude with cautions, a short section on cleaning and battery replacement, and a review of key points. The technique of light-guided intubation evolved from the knowledge that a very bright light placed at the end of an endotracheal tube can transilluminate the tissues of the upper airway. By observing the glow, the position of the tube tip can be monitored. Advancing the tube until the glow is seen to begin to disappear beneath the sternum reliably positions the tube midway between the cords and the carina. For all but the extremely frail or petite patient, as these fluoroscopic and video images demonstrate, there is essentially no translumination if the tube and trach light are in the esophagus. Contrast this with a bright, well-defined glow when the tube is in the trachea. The trach light is a versatile tool that is useful in a variety of patients. Because proper placement of endotracheal tubes can be performed without the need to see the cords, the trach light can be particularly useful in certain patients previously considered to be difficult. Patients requiring stabilization of the C-spine take little more time to intubate than routine patients. The same is true for patients with restricted mouth openings or capped teeth. Patients with poor dentition, possibly due to trauma. Or patients with a severe overbite. Light-guided intubation truly revolutionizes the placement of tubes in these patient groups. Light-guided intubation offers benefits for routine patients as well. Research comparing the technique with laryngoscopic intubation has shown that it requires less time and causes less of an increase in the patient's hemodynamic status. Also, because light-guided intubation, when performed with the trach light, requires only modest finger pressure, it has been shown to be far less traumatic than laryngoscopic intubation. Mm -hmm. The intubation of an emergency patient represents a particular challenge. The potential for aspiration may require the establishment of a patent airway as quickly as possible, yet positioning the patient may be contraindicated, making laryngoscopic intubation difficult, if not impossible. Okay. Again, light-guided intubation okay. using the trach light can offer an effective alternative. See? Recent research has shown light-guided intubation to be equally useful when a tube is to be placed nasally. In experienced hands, this technique also is rapid and relatively easy. For patients who have been previously intubated, the glow from the trach light can quickly provide confirmatory evidence that the tube is in the trachea and allow the tube tip to be accurately positioned. When the numbers on the wand align with those on the tube and the glow is seen at the sternal notch, research has shown that the tip of the tube is almost exactly midway between the cords and the carina. The trach light consists of two parts, a durable reusable handle that contains batteries and power control circuitry and a light wand designed for single patient use. The wand features an extremely bright bulb bonded to one end of a flexible tube and encased in a protective sheath. Affixed to the other end is a rigid plastic connector that attaches the light wand to the top surface of the handle and allows it to be adjusted to accommodate endotracheal tubes of different lengths. 
Included within each one is a specially designed intubation stylet. As we will discuss, this stylet, which stiffens the wand, can be partially retracted to create flexibility at the tip. A clamp on the front of the handle accepts the 15 millimeter fitting on standard endotracheal tubes. Centimeter markings are printed on the wand. When these are aligned with the numbers on the tube, the bulb will be positioned at the tube tip. Remove the wand from its package, orient the stylet, and press it firmly into the slot. Now, pass the tip of the wand through the clamp and, while squeezing the connector release arm, carefully slide the connector onto the handle. Lubricate with a water-soluble lubricant. Insert the wand, push the fitting firmly into the clamp, and flip the locking lever. Squeeze the release arm and adjust the wand so that the bulb is within the tube just proximal to the bevel. Note that this aligns the centimeter markings. Now, where the wand is marked bend here, make a tight 90 degree bend. Creating this bend accurately is important. A bend that does not form a right angle, is not tight enough, or is too far from the tube tip can make the intubation procedure considerably more difficult. Preparation of the trachylite is completed by lubricating the tip of the tube. Prepare and oxygenate the patient as you normally would. Unless contraindicated, extend the patient's neck. Now, from the side of the mouth, so the midline is unobstructed, grasp the patient's tongue and jaw and pull upward. Switch on the trachylite and position it at the back of the mouth in the midline. Now, moving your hand along an imaginary arc, while cocking your wrist, gently advance the tube until resistance is felt. If the glow is midline, gently cocking your wrist further will cause the tip to pass through the cords and to press against the anterior wall of the trachea, which, in a patient, produces a bright and well-defined glow. Release the tongue and jaw and hold the tube against the lips. With the forefinger and thumb, Retract the stylet approximately 10 centimeters. Lift the tongue and jaw again and gently advance the tip by cocking your wrist until the glow illuminates the sternal notch. Once again, holding the tube against the lips, release the locking lever. Grasp the trachylite handle and with firm pressure, pull the trachylite out of the tube. It is possible that after advancing the tube from the oral pharynx, the glow will be seen to be offset laterally. In this case, move your hand slightly away from you, which rocks the tip backwards. Reposition the tube in the midline and reverse the motion of your hand, moving it slightly towards you while cocking your wrist. This moves the tip of the tube upwards, behind the tongue, and through the cords. If, as the tip is advanced, the light disappears, the tip is passed below the opening to the cords into the esophagus. In this case, withdraw the tube until the light is again seen, realign the tube to the midline, and advance it again. Let's review what we've just seen, this time on a real patient. Establish a tight 90 degree bend. Unless contraindicated, position the patient. Lift the tongue and jaw. Advance the tube along the midline until the laryngeal prominence is seen to be illuminated. Gently advance the tip through the cords until you see the characteristic bright, well-defined glow. Retract the stylet approximately 10 centimeters. Advance the glow to the sternal notch. Release the clamp and remove the trach light, completing the intubation in typical fashion. To check the position of an in-place endotracheal tube, Remove the stylet entirely, making the wand completely flexible. Attach the wand to the handle, but do not advance it towards the clamp. Lubricate the tip of the wand, and with the trach light turned on, slide the wand into the in-place tube until the 15 millimeter fitting is seated firmly. Flip the locking lever, now squeeze the release arm, and watch for the glow moving down the trachea as you advance the connector 
until the centimeter markings on the wand lined up with those on the tube. If the glow is not visible at or near the sternal notch, the cuff should be deflated. The tube can now be safely pulled back. When the glow appears just above the sternum, anchor the tube, remove the trach light, reinflate the cuff, and proceed with standard ventilation practices. Note that if no transillumination is noted as the wand is advanced, it is likely that the tube is in the esophagus. Should this occur, before removing the tube, attempt to confirm placement with conventional techniques such as end tidal CO2, x-ray, or auscultation. While light-guided intubation can greatly simplify the proper placement of an endotracheal tube, all of the normal precautions should be observed. This is especially true in the morbidly obese patient, where the ability to see the glow may be compromised. In these patients, stretching the skin over the laryngeal prominence can be helpful. Reducing the level of ambient lighting may also be helpful, as it allows the glow to be more readily seen. At the other extreme is the very thin or frail patient whose neck is so readily transilluminated that the glow does not completely disappear even when the tube is in the esophagus. Notice, however, the difference in the transilluminated glow when the trachelite and tube have advanced beyond the cords into the trachea. Beginning by placing the tube in the piriform fossa to establish a reference brightness in both thin and obese patients may be helpful. Notice also that the trach light can be effectively used while cricoid pressure is applied. In non-emergency situations, light-guided intubation may be contraindicated due to inflammatory laryngeal disorders such as epiglottitis or tracheal stenosis or due to laryngeal or tracheal abnormalities such as polyps, tumors, or a retropharyngeal abscess or by the presence of a foreign body. In a hypoxic patient who requires emergent intubation, there are no absolute contraindications. However, as with any device, experience should be gained through prior practice in routine non-emergency patients. The handle is reusable and can be easily cleaned with any appropriate contact cleaner. Do not attempt to autoclave, sterilize, or clean either the wand or the handle other than as shown. If the wand is to be reused on the same patient, it should be cleaned with an appropriate disinfectant in accordance with your hospital's protocol. If this calls for the wand to be soaked, be sure not to allow the connector to become submerged or to allow cleaning solution to flow into the lumen that holds the stylet. The trach light requires three AAA alkaline batteries. To install them, insert a coin in the slot and turn counterclockwise one eighth turn. Position them as shown on the diagram on the inner wall. The positive end of the lower battery faces outward, while the positive end of the upper two face inward. Installation is completed by replacing and securing the lid. Sealed within the handle is a power control circuit that provides the needed current to the bulb to ensure a bright glow even as the batteries wear down. As the batteries approach the end of their useful life, but before the brightness of the bulb has been significantly reduced, the green light just behind the on-off switch will blink off and be replaced by a red light. This indicates that the battery should be replaced at the next opportunity. The control circuit also serves another function. It causes the lamp to blink after 30 seconds to indicate that reoxygenating the patient may be appropriate and to prevent heat buildup. Key points to remember. Starting with the correct bend is very important. While no two patients are alike, experience has shown that a tight 90 degree bend is preferred because too soft a bend can lead to difficulty in finding the entrance to the glottic opening. When lifting the patient's tongue and jaw, position your hand to one side so the trach light can be positioned in the midline. 
In certain patients, checking the glow in the piriform fossa to establish a reference brightness may be helpful. The strength of the glow you will see will vary based on the ambient lighting in the particular patient. However, the brightness you see will be consistent with the brightness seen when the tube is just beyond the cords. In extremely thin patients, some transillumination may be noted even if the tube is in the esophagus. However, when the characteristic bright, well-defined circular glow is seen in the midline, just below the laryngeal prominence, the tube tip is through the cords. If the glow is seen to be off to one side, gently rock the tube tip back to clear the aryepiglottic folds. Adjust the tube to the midline and gently advance it again. If necessary, repeat this procedure until the laryngeal prominence is illuminated. Once the tip has passed the glottic opening, trying to move the tip medially from the piriform fossa is generally not effective. Rather, you should rock the tip back, rotate it to the midline, and gently advance it. When the laryngeal prominence becomes illuminated, retract the stylet about 10 centimeters. This creates flexibility at the tip, which allows the tube to be safely and gently advanced down the trachea. Retracting the stylet more than 10 centimeters is not desirable because it limits your ability to control the tip of the tube. If the tube hangs up, while maintaining a gentle inward pressure, move the handle 90 degrees and return it to vertical. This generally allows the tip to find its way through the cords. When the tip is just beyond the cords and the stylet has been retracted, be sure to again lift the tongue and jaw which lifts the back of the tongue, allowing the tube to be easily advanced. Intubation of awake patients can be readily accomplished with the trach light, provided that an appropriate topical anesthesia has been provided. When properly performed, light-guided intubation requires almost no force. If, during the procedure, the upper portion of the wand is bending, too much force is being applied. Rather than pushing harder, pull back slightly, adjust the position of the tip, lift the tongue and jaw, and gently advance the tube again. Inability to gently advance the tube along the midline may indicate the presence of an unexpected abnormality, in which case alternative techniques may be more appropriate. A substantial amount of research has been published on both the technique of light-guided intubation and the use of the trach light itself. Recent studies comparing it with laryngoscopic intubation have found light-guided intubation using the trach light to cause less trauma, to require less time, and to minimize increases in a patient's hemodynamic status, and to provide a highly accurate method for precisely positioning in place tubes. To receive copies of any of these studies, contact your local Lairdall representative.